Good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, all of you to the Wilson Center and acknowledge the presence of many of our board members in our front row, um, especially uh, the chairman of our board, uh, Ambassador Joe Gildenhorn, his wife Alma Gildenhorn, uh, Barry Jackson, Sander Gerber, the vice chairman of our board, and his wife, and uh, others, and supporters of the Wilson Center. Uh, also uh, recognize Hale Esfandiari, who is the, who directs our, our extraordinary Middle East uh, program. And um, I'm looking for other staff, but let me just move on with this. Um, Ehud Olmert came to Washington late last night. I'm sure this is his thousandth visit. Uh, but he graces us um, by appearing today uh, at an event moderated by Aaron Miller. And he will go on after this to some other of our friendly competitors. But he's coming here first. Um, <laughs> uh, we note this. Uh, our, uh, the, the subject of uh, Middle East peace has been addressed here for years. Uh, if you want to know, and I'm sure you will hear it today, who has made um, w one of the few who have made the biggest effort for Middle East peace, he's sitting right to my left. Uh, a few weeks ago here, we hosted an event focused on getting to a two-state solution, a regional perspective. Uh, and we had, uh, I just want you to know, my friend, uh, an extraordinary group of people, uh, Raith uh, al Omari. Uh, the executive director of the American Task Force on Palestine, Marwan Mouasher, whom I'm sure you know, the former Jordanian foreign minister, and Gilad Sher, the head of the Institute for National Security Studies um, and, and former Israeli chief uh, peace negotiator. Aaron Miller uh, moderated that conversation, and everyone who heard it came away saying, why isn't this happening? And, oh, by the way, if a few years ago uh, an offer that Israel made had been accepted, we wouldn't even have to have this conversation. Um, elected to the Knesset at the tender age of 28, Ehud Olmert began his career as, and continues, as a maverick. Uh, he has had a breadth and depth of experience in Israeli politics, including serving as mayor of Jerusalem, which is where I first met him, Minister of Health, Minister of Trade and Industry and Labor, Minister in Charge of the Land Administration and the Broadcasting Authority, and of course, Israel's 12th Prime Minister. His more than 30 meetings with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas represented perhaps the most intensive effort yet to reach an agreement on final status. And the positions Omer took on the core issues reflected Israel's most far-reaching efforts to reach a negotiated settlement. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, in her memoirs, called some of uh, former Prime Minister's, uh, the former Prime Minister's 2008 negotiating positions in the name of peace remarkable. Today, uh, Ehud Olmert is still out front pushing the importance of an Israeli-Palestinian -Pal agreement, uh, and I, for one, remain bullish that we will have it. It is not only uh, in the interests of uh, the Palestinians, but it is clearly in the interests of Israelis to do this. And hopefully, uh, with conversations like the one we're having today and with efforts in the region, uh, including the, uh, the uh, uh, Arab Peace Initiative, which has been resurrected by the Arab League, uh, there will be more pressure on both countries uh, to reach a final status agreement. Um, as my friend David Ignatius detailed in his column last week in the Washington Post, a Kerry advisor uh, emphasized that um, uh, Secretary Kerry wants to convey to people in the region how peace would improve their daily lives. Uh, as you all know, uh, Secretary Kerry has made four trips to the region since becoming secretary and plans to remain keenly active. And maybe that initiative, which certainly I personally applaud, uh, will also make a difference. Uh, I have a dream that the Mideast region becomes an economic powerhouse, a trade center focused on rich resources, uh, information technology and the internet and human capital. All countries in the region would win if this occurred, and surely Israel, living in peace with her neighbors, finally uh, would not only be a winner, but a great partner for others in the region. Uh, I last saw Ehud in Herzliya about a month ago uh, at a dinner the next morning, 
he was running a, planning to run a half marathon in Tel Aviv and then take off for the United States. He did these things. There was record heat in Tel Aviv. A lot of people had trouble with the half marathon, but he just told me it was one of his best times ever. And so, my friends, one of our best times ever is welcoming uh, Prime Minister Ehud Olmert here. And then following his remarks uh, are uh, impressive. Um, Aaron David Miller will ask him some questions. Please welcome Prime Minister Olmert. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and providing me with this opportunity. Uh, to uh, be at this uh, very prestigious uh, institute, uh, distinguished board members, Ambassador Guildhorn, and uh, all the guests sitting here, and of course my friend, Aaron David Miller, whose family I know uh, I, for generations, starting with his grandfather uh, in Cleveland. Um, since I'm going to make a short statement at the beginning, I'll leave some of the issues uh, to uh, a perhaps later discussion with David, uh, Aaron and then with uh, questions coming from the crowd. I want to make a statement which I think is uh, a premise that must be understood and accepted and I think is the most important uh, basis for the understanding of uh, the uh, conviction that I have, and I think quite a few in Israel and many outside of Israel, that this is possibly the last, but also the best time that we have to make peace, uh, the last crucial peace that we have to make with our neighbors. This is the peace with the Palestinians. I think and I, I know that this opinion is shared by many, many in the defense establishment in Israel that in the last 65 years since the proclamation of the State of Israel, there never was a time in which Israel was in a better security shape than we are now. From a strategic point of view, the dangers that Israel faces today are smaller and are more manageable than ever before. When we look at the immediate surrounding of the state of Israel, at the neighboring countries, the traditional enemies of Israel that once uh, we looked at with a certain degree of fear are not potential players in any possible attack that can jeopardize the existence of the State of Israel. Look at Syria. Maybe we'll come back to it later. I don't know whether Assad will remain in power. I don't know whether he will be replaced. I don't know if he will be replaced, who will replace it. I don't know who, who amongst the different uh, forces that are now fighting against Assad uh, will be the one that, uh, uh, that will take over and what his uh, general attitude will be. I don't know. I know one thing. Neither he nor the possible uh, uh, future leaders of Syria will have the power, the capacity, the energy, and the resources to fight with the State of Israel for the foreseeable future. I hear all these uh, talks lately about uh, dangers in Syria. I think it's grossly exaggerated. And the first to know it are the Syrians. Therefore, I don't think, not that we don't have to look carefully at what happens in Syria, should, should we have to. Not that we don't have to be prepared for any eventuality that will surprise us. We have to be very careful and look closely at every point in Syria, and we had to do it in the past, and sometimes we were surprised and we had to take uh, actions, not necessarily talking about it publicly, uh, but taking important actions in order to uh, remove dangers that may have come from Syria. But when I look at Syria today, I know that Syria is not a strategic threat on the state of Israel. 
Certainly not Egypt. We have formal peace with Egypt. We could have better relations with Egypt. Unfortunately, presently, uh, with the Muslim Brothers leadership, it may take more time to find a new basis that will be established between us and them that will improve the uh, uh, daily contact between the two governments. But I think the Egyptians are very careful not to cross a line which may be dangerous first for them because they understand one thing which sometimes when you come to power you understand and when you are in opposition in an non, entirely non-democratic country you may not understand that the responsibility for feeding 80 million people every day is far more important than entering into adventures that might end up with a terrible disaster for your own people and your own country. And therefore, Egypt is certainly not in the picture for any development that may jeopardize the security and the strategic interest of the state of Israel. So where is the danger? There is one danger, Iran. Iran is a danger not to Israel alone. I was involved in dealing with this issue for almost 10 years in different capacities when I was a member of the cabinet of Sharon and then when I became prime minister myself. I think I'm familiar with the basic facts just as much as anyone else, any place. I remember that in 2003, when I was a member of the select committee of ministers in the cabinet of Sharon that dealt with Iran directly on a daily basis, we were advised by the top experts that by the year 2008, the latest 2009, no question that Iran will possess nuclear power. Well, we are now in the middle of 2013. They still don't possess it. I think that we have to very carefully look at it. I think that we have to take measures in order to prevent it. I think that we did take measures that were very harmful to the nuclear plans of Iran over the last uh, few years. And I'm very proud that the government that I was leading was very active in many different ways that obviously are not to be uh, discussed in details publicly that uh, certainly did not help the nuclear program of Iran, and I think that we were assisted by friendly nations, primarily by the United States of America, which for no good reason was blamed for not doing anything, which is not true. But I think, and I said it then, and I still I think... I that the Wilson Center would host a war criminal such as yourself, oh who would be sure that you, the international community will hold you accountable for your work. Elliot! You know, I always wonder, these guys that heckle me sometimes in these meetings, <laughs> they don't remember that I am a graduate of the Israeli Knesset. <laughs> when someone has been nine terms in the Israeli Knesset, do you think that one heckler <laughs> can shake him off? <laughs> I mean, let's take it seriously. We come from a democracy where such voices... Why did he leave? He should have stayed. Tell him that he can come back. I will not hold it against him. Anyway, um, so uh, uh, I think that uh, Iran is a problem. It's a serious problem. It's a serious problem for many countries. And this issue, as I used to say time and again when I was prime minister, must be led by the United States of America and other major uh, powers in the world. Because if Iran, hopefully not, and I'm certain it will not, reach the point where they possess nuclear power, it can change entirely, not just the balance, but the stability, not only in our region, but maybe much further. And it can create uh, 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 turbulence and, and force other nations to uh, possess nuclear powers, and this can create a danger, and I'm not certain that President Obama wants 
that the legacy that will be left after his second uh, term as president of the United States will be a nuclear Iran. And therefore, while we have to see how America will react to this in the future and what the measures that America will take with others in order to realize what the president made as a commitment, but it still echoes in my ears what President Obama said, what uh, Secretary of uh, Defense Chuck Hegel said, what Secretary of State John Kerry said, Iran will not be nuclear. When the president and the two of the most powerful and important uh, secretaries of the United States say in no unclear terms, in the most explicit manner, that Iran will not be nuclear, I assume that they know what they are talking about, and I take very seriously the impact of their commitment as the leaders of the Western world and the ones that ought to lead this campaign against Iran. Therefore, I made all these uh, preliminary comments about the dangers basically to say that indeed I share entirely the analysis made by Secretary Kerry yesterday night when he said that this is the best time and maybe the last time for the State of Israel to engage in a serious dialogue in order to achieve peace with the Palestinians. This I is the... I am not resisting your occupation. This is what Plus and the rest of the American people think of your peace process. To hell with you and your occupation. Free my people and free Palestine. We will never be Palestinians. He doesn't look like a Palestinian. <laughs> he looks like... He looks like <laughs> he looks like an American. That's fine. Even Americans are allowed to protest. That's all right. We have some Israelis who do it the same way. But uh, uh, I think that this is the right time. This is there can be no better time. This is not only the right time. This is possibly, as Senator Kerry, Secretary Kerry said last night, may prove to be the last time that we can make an agreement with the Palestinians, and therefore I hope that uh, both sides will take serious measures in order to uh, uh, participate in this process, and that the Americans and the American administration will move all the forces that are needed in order to support such a process between us and the Palestinians in the very near future. Thank you very much. So we'll be talk I don't stand for this. You are wanted in several countries, and many of you do not know that. This doesn't even explain his war crimes, okay? Look into it. You're a murderer. Shame on Woodrow Wilson for inviting a war criminal. This is disgusting. Fourteen hundred people were killed in Operation Cast Blood. My former partner was there. It was her job to collect the bodies. She was working for the American Red Cross. She saw Israeli soldiers playing soccer with the head of a two-year-old child. She found a woman's body with maggots crawling out of the bullet holes. You might have prevented this. You might have prevented this. You're a murderer. You talk about peace. Yes. I'd like to request that uh, law enforcement move down to the front here. I'd also like to repeat that the Wilson Center uh, is proud of inviting people to express a broad cross-section of views. As the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, I defend that process. I also defend free speech in this country, uh, but it is unfortunate that people feel, feel it necessary to disrupt a gathering where they could peacefully and civilly ask questions. Would law enforcement please move to the front in case there are any more disturbances? Thank you. Uh, Aaron, please proceed. Aaron, I must say, first of all, you continue to impress and, and surprise. Um, and, and I will formally apologize to you, too. I mean, we live in a democratic polity. People have the right to express their views. I've been here for quite a few years now, and rarely, if ever, have I seen this sort of of rudeness, and you, you have dealt with it in an extremely graceful and um, 
and, and classy manner, and I appreciate that too. Thank you very much. I just want I, to say, Aaron, yeah. uh, just before you continue, that uh, when these guys made a mistake, they don't understand that for me in Israel, there couldn't be any better PR than their comments <laughs> because there are so many Israelis who are pissed off with me because they don't share necessarily the opinion of uh, Jane Herman that uh, what I did in order to uh, close the gap and make peace between Israel and the Palestinians, offering the most far-reaching concession that Israel has ever offered in the history of the State of Israel, that it was good. They thought that I was betraying the principles of Israel. Now these guys come and say that I'm a war criminal. For many Israelis, it will, may restore some of my reputation. <laughs> so you guys, you know, think about it. If that's what you want. <laughs> I really do want to get to questions from our guests, but I want to drill down in three areas. And let's start with the, with the peace issue. You know, if you look at the history of peacemaking on the Israeli side, it really is a history of transformed hawks. It's really not a story of persistent doves. It's largely men who, as a consequence of changes on the ground and their own changing calculations, have reached out and responded. Begin, Rabin, uh, Sharon in terms of withdrawal from Gaza, you very much belong to that Great. group of, tr of transformers. So your discussions with Abu Mazen are among the new urban legends of the peace process. There's a lot of misunderstanding that swirls around these discussions over a period of a year or two. Um, so can, can you get to, the, get to the main issue here? What, what exactly happened? Did Mahmoud Abbas accept part of it, reject it all, fail, failure, fail to get back to you? I mean, you, you talked to tower.org and you said that you're still waiting for Abbas's call, uh, which I assume means you never got a formal response. But what, I what is the story here? Number one, I, I met with uh, Abu Mazen maybe 36 times, four hours each time. Most of the meetings were private, just four eyes, him and me. It always started with a lunch in the residence of the Prime Minister in Jerusalem uh, with the staff. Then uh, we left the staff. They remained in the uh, dining hall talking, uh, smoking. Uh, and we went to uh, my study and we talked for hours. On the first meeting, on the 23rd of December 2006, which means a year before Annapolis, okay? I say to uh, Abbas, uh, when we uh, left for the study for a private talk, I say to him, President, everything is on the table. Everything means everything. Refugees, borders, Jerusalem, the holy sites, everything. So. I have, not that I don't have preconditions. I'm ready to talk about everything, and I don't tell you now that I have preconditions that Israel will have uh, a military presence in the uh, Jordan Valley, that uh, Jerusalem will not be discussed or will not be uh, what they call divided. I think shared is much better, is much more accurate, because that part of Jerusalem which the Palestinians really are insisting on is not really part of what we thought Jerusalem was for generations. Abu Dis, Isawiya, Jabal Muqabba, uh, what, what do they have to do with what we consider to be the important part for us of Jerusalem? Therefore, I thought this was sharing. Everything is on the table. So from day one, Abu Mazen knew that I'm serious and that I'm ready to hit on all the issues that could ultimately resolve the outstanding differences between us and the Palestinians, to start with. I remember and I, I respect that in one of those lunches that was followed by the uh, uh, private meetings with Abu Mazen, one of the uh, attendees, I think, I don't remember who he was, he said to me, yes, you say that you are ready to uh, accept a Palestinian state. But you guys have a mistake. When we talk about a Palestinian state, we talk about a normal state like any other state, a sovereign state without any presence of any soldier of the neighboring country 
inside our sovereign territory. And you must remember it if you really seriously, genuinely want to appear as a peacemaker between us and you. And my immediate response was, I understand it and my peace plan does not include a military presence of Israel in any part of the West Bank and the borders that we will agree with on the basis of swaps of territories based on 67. And I think that this approach that I am prepared to pull out entirely, except for the three centers that President Bush was talking about, they will be swapped with territories that uh, were part of the State of Israel prior to 67. I think that they finally understood that I'm in business, that I'm not here to just fool around. And also, and I said it in Annapolis, but I said it before Annapolis, in the presence of Secretary Rice and uh, the envoy to the Middle East, Tony Blair, former Prime Minister of Great Britain, of many of your congressmen, uh, including uh, Howard Berman, at that time he was uh, the chairman of the uh, Foreign Relations uh, Committee of uh, the House and others, I, for the first time, talk about the suffering of the Palestinian refugees and the fact that Israel is not indifferent to this suffering and that I believe that within the context of an agreement and within the framework of the Arab Peace Initiative, the refugee issue ought to be dealt with and resolved. And I talked about also compensations which will be paid to all those that suffered from the wars between Israel and the Palestinians, including Jews, that uh, suffered a lot. There were hundreds of thousands of Jews that were expelled from Arab Muslim countries because they were uh, perceived to be affiliated and identified with the uh, Jews that were fighting with the Arabs. And they also deserve compensation, but that there will be an arrangement with the support of the international community. In other words, I have addressed myself to all the issues. And finally, I have proposed Abu Mazen a comprehensive uh, plan, including a map of the borders of the Palestinian state of the state of Israel with the territorial swaps. And the territories which were part of the state of Israel prior to 67 were indicated very clearly on the map. I saw two weeks ago there, there was someone that got probably from Abu Mazen. Now, he wanted me to give him the map. Israel is a terrorist state! And, and uh, I uh, asked, <coughs> I asked uh, Abu Mazen, if you sign on initials in this map, I'll give it to you. Uh, he asked me why. I said, I'll tell you, to be honest, President, I know that there is a danger which I can't afford to take. <laughs> I'll give you the map. You'll take it home. You may come back, you may not. If you'll not come back, in two years' time, you'll come to another Israeli prime minister and you'll say, now, this I already had a long time ago. Now, if you want to start negotiations, let's start from here and move forward, and I don't want to be used. So if you sign it, you can take it. If not, tell me, what do you want me to do? This is the plan. I am ready to sign it right now. I didn't consult with anyone. I, don't, I, I, I take upon myself the responsibility as Prime Minister of Israel to sign it right now. Sign it. And he said, well, it's very serious. It's very serious, but I'm not an, an expert on maps. So perhaps my map expert and your map expert will see tomorrow morning and they will discuss it. Maybe we can sign it in two, three days. I said, President, Take my word, in the next 50 years, there will be no prime minister in Israel that will offer you what I did. Take it now, sign it, let's make history. Let's go in two days time to the UN Security Council, it was in September of 2008. And we will go through the uh, motions in the United Nations, we'll have a vote I'm sure 15, all the members of the Security Council will support this, and then we'll ask a General Assembly to support it, and then we'll go to the Congress and the joint session of Congress with the President of America, and both of us will be standing there and will give us uh, uh, support, and then we'll go to the European uh, 
parliament and they will ask all of the leaders of the world to come to Jerusalem, to the center of Jerusalem, to the point where the two parts will be merged and separated, if you want, okay? And, and they will say, this is the peace plan, this is what we need to do, and then I'll go for elections, you'll go for elections, and we'll win it. And he said, I need two, three more days, you know, they will sit tomorrow, we summon to the room, my uh, political advisor, uh, Shalom Tujman, and, uh, and uh, Sai Barikat, who is the chief negotiator for the Palestinians, they say, tomorrow we meet and we will go with the experts of maps and so on and so forth. The next day, uh, Sai Barikat called and he said, President, you know, we, we forgot yesterday that we have to be in Amman today, so let's postpone it for a week. I said, okay, a week is still <laughs> a re relevant time. They never came back to me. Now, it's true, they never said no. They said it was serious. And what is more important, what is more important, is that fundamentally, I think, based on what I heard from Abu Mazen time and again through all kinds of friends that went to see him and came to talk to me and vice versa, that fundamentally he understood that this is the shape of the deal. Now, that maybe there was still a room for a little fine-tuning which had to be made. But there were other reasons that influenced him. But he kept saying all the time, and he kept passing the message to me, don't ever say that I said no because I didn't say no. And that's precisely why I think that this is the time now that this plan will be brought back to center stage because this is the only time in the history of the conflict and the negotiations between us and them that the Palestinian leader said that he doesn't reject something which was proposed by us as a re real, genuine, serious basis for a conclusion of the conflict between us and them. Right, so the next logical question is, uh, the current government of Israel is probably too divided to do what you say. The Palestinians are, um, weak and, and under great pressure. So the obvious implication of what you're saying is that somebody should, in fact, use your baseline as a point of departure to begin a negotiation with active mediation to achieve an end of conflict and with Arab state support, presumably, and uh, American energy to drive the process you might argue that now, in fact, is the time in order to achieve an agreement based largely on the parameters that you have accepted and Mahmoud Abbas has at least acquiesced in believing represent the shape of, of, of a solution. Is that, is that fair? You can't speak for the Americans or the Arabs, but... I, 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 that's right. I can't speak for the Americans. I can't speak for the Palestinians. I even... I'm I think that I can't speak for the government of Israel. Perhaps I can <laughs> speak for them less than I can speak for the others, <laughs> for obvious reasons. I don't think that the prime minister is in a particular love with uh, my opinion. It's not, it's not personal. It's not that we sure. have any personal feud, but you know, he has a different policy, and this is well known. And uh, unfortunately, this policy is not supported by me, and I think by the majority of the Israelis. By the majority of the Israelis, the fact is that the Likud and the uh, Lieberman uh, faction together received 31 votes, uh, which means that they lost 25% of the political power in the last elections. This was a stunning defeat for their policy. And the only reason why Bibi is still prime minister is because there was no one that challenged him on that position for prime minister. No one of the others was, except maybe for Shelly Yechimovich, but her candidacy, uh, uh, self-proclaimed candidacy, was never uh, 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 accepted by anyone to be very serious or, or very uh, challenging. So, um, so I think that, uh, yes, uh, Israel should have, this is my opinion, that Israel not because of the Palestinians, not by, and even I, I would take one step further and say, I don't blame, I never did, nor will I do, 
Israel for not having peace with the Palestinians. I think we made terrible mistakes over the years. I am included. In previous times, before I was prime minister, in my different positions. But as you say, you know, at some point in life, when you take all these elements together and try to build up a comprehensive picture from this puzzle, you have to reach, if you want to be true to yourself, if what you say that you want peace is genuine, then sometimes you have to change your, uh, your opinions, you have to change your positions. You have to, to uh, admit that you made a mistake. I made mistakes. I never tried to excuse myself. I said I made mistakes. I admitted I was wrong. I misunderstood certain things which eventually I understood. And when I understood them, I drew the necessary inevitable conclusions. And at the end of the day, I proposed. One can say it was too late. But I became prime minister only in 2006. I wasn't prime minister before, but when I became prime minister, I was ready. And what I proposed, is, as Jane said before, was the most far-reaching peace plan that was ever proposed by any prime minister in the history of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. So I think that we should adopt this now. But uh, I think that the basic problem, the real basic problem that uh, stays between us and the Palestinians is not an understanding about the nature of what will ultimately be the, uh, the uh, plan that will be accepted. I think that both sides understand that what I've proposed is, is it more or less. You know, with a very tiny fine tuning that needs to be made of a fraction of a percent here or there you know, of uh, another little uh, piece of territory in the swaps there uh, 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 as against uh, another place. Uh, tiny things, because the fundamental basic things of A, that Jerusalem is the capital of the Palestinians and Jerusalem is certainly the capital of the Jewish people and the state of Israel, no question about it, but it's also shared with the Palestinians that the borders are on the basis of 67, that the refugee issue will be resolved in a adequate manner within the framework of the Arab Peace Initiative. I repeat again, all the accusations that Israel ignored the Arab Peace Initiative are untrue. I said it in Annapolis. Everyone can read the speech. And I said it before in the Savant Forum in Jerusalem with the presence of, of Condi Rice and others, that Israel is prepared to negotiate the, the uh, refugee issue within the framework of the Arab Peace Initiative. And I propose specific ideas about how to do it. And we talked, and I said it would be part of the agreement about the suffering of the Palestinian people on the basis of, just on a human basis, as a result of the wars between us and them, as we will speak about the suffering of Jews over all these years as a result of these wars. And, and, and there's so many terrorist actions that uh, were perpetrated against innocent civilians in the state of Israel, which killed thousands of innocent people, and so on and so forth. So all this was, was proposed. Now, so therefore, I can't say that uh, we are uh, guilty of not having peace. I don't want to blame the Palestinians. I think that the Palestinians should also make clear that they are ready to complete, to conclude the dialogue on that basis. Now, if both countries will do it, then I think it will be easier for the Americans to use the energies of Secretary Kerry, and I admire his energies and his dedication, I have to say, and I have enormous respect for uh, uh, Secretary Kerry for his emotional involvement and his determination to carry on in this direction. I hope that he will be successful in mobilizing the support, the more active support of the president on a daily basis, just as Bush did, just as Clinton did. I don't think that there was one day in the presidency of uh, Bill Clinton that he didn't deal with the Middle East. And I think that uh, Bush spent a lot of time on these issues and was familiar with all the details. I think that President Obama must understand that the key to changing the Middle East and the key to bring more stability in the Arab countries, which are now are 
uh, in a very shaky situation is an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. And it, this is not a minor issue, this is a vital issue, not just for us, but equally for the Palestinians, for the Middle East, for other countries, and therefore for the national interest of the United States of America. And uh, I hope that they will draw the necessary conclusions. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's time. I, I have many more questions, but I will not ask them. Um, to go to, uh, to your question. So let's start uh, right here in the second row. There is a but mic. Please identify yourself if you don't yes. mind, okay? Thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah, I want to begin by... Could you identify yourself? <laughs> My name is Banal Chivirige. I want to applaud... Uh, Banal? Banal Chivirige. I want to begin by applauding the former Prime Minister for being a peace activist. I really agree with you. We all need peace. And peace is a great notion that we all cherish. But I strongly believe that in our cherishing for peace and desiring to have peace, we must not lose who we are. On the question of Israel and Palestine, I see a situation where you seem to be saying like, Israel, if it means Israel losing who Israel is, they should do it for the sake of peace. And to me, that, for instance, specifically on the question of Jerusalem, from all sources, archeological sources, and even present history, the question of Jerusalem not being the capital, purportedly, as today we all know, because many people are saying Jerusalem is not the capital of, of, of Israel. I think this is something that is very fundamental, that Israel must not seem to be losing out its heart, simply because we are trying to say, oh, let us reach out to our brothers, the Palestinians. Thank you very much. Then I question number two. Question number two. Only one, because we, we really, but thank you very much, Ehud. Well, uh, briefly, uh, uh, as, as you heard, I think that Jerusalem is and will always be the capital of the Jewish people. There is no question about it. It's obvious. I've never had any other idea, nor will I have in the future. Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish people. The question is whether what is now defined as the city limit of Jerusalem is necessarily all of it is the part of Jerusalem which is of importance and of significance historically and, and in the future for the Jewish people. And that is a, a, a about which I have a different opinion from some of my uh, friends who uh, say different things and think different things from what they say. Because when I ask everyone, tell me, do you really think that Jabal Muqabra has been the site for which Jews were praying for 2,000 years when they talked about returning back to Jerusalem? They all smile if they, if they don't laugh. I ask if, uh, if, uh, if uh, Shoafat is the place that we all prayed for all our lives when we talked about returning to Zion. And they all laugh. So why is it important to have Israeli sovereignty over those neighborhoods which are fully inhabited only by Palestinians, which are not part of the historic of, uh, part of, uh, of Jerusalem, why do they need to be part of the state of Israel if this is the barrier between peace and war forever? And I'm saying it as a former mayor of Jerusalem. I was 10 years mayor of Jerusalem and Aaron was at that time the head of Seeds for Peace which was located in the east side of Jerusalem and he visited there every week and he maybe uh, uh, lived in Israel for a long time and, and, and he knows that I was a very, uh, a very tough fighter for the, you know, the, what they call the United City of Jerusalem. And I reached a conclusion, to be true to myself only, that there are many parts of the city of Jerusalem which are not equal to other parts. And all these parts which are not equal in terms of the quality of life, in terms of the rights of the people, in terms of the daily living of these people, are the parts where Palestinians live. And I said, probably, the, the slogan of a united city 
is incompatible with the reality that we can create on ground. And this is not something that we can ignore for a long time. Therefore, I reached the conclusion that we have to keep the part of Jerusalem which is essential for us, and this is the capital, and then it will be recognized by the entire international community. My dear friends, let's not forget it. We say Bill Clinton was a great friend of Israel. George Bush was a great friend of Israel. Obama is a great friend of Israel. Did any of them ever recognize Jerusalem to be the capital of the state of Israel? West Jerusalem, not East Jerusalem. That part which was part of the state of Israel prior to 67. Did they ever recognize it as the capital of the state of Israel as they promised before elections, all of them? No. So I want to be practical. I want to be, I want, I want to be, to, to come to the point where we can solve issues rather than continue arguing about it for forever without solving the problems and thus maybe creating a reality in which it will be impossible to make uh, a, a solution that, that will maintain the democratic nature of the state of Israel and the Jewish nature of the state of Israel, which for me is essential because my parents came from China in 1933 to live in the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state and I don't want now that I will inherit to my grandchildren something which is entirely different. So, you know, in life you sometimes have to make compromises. And the compromises is that there are parts of Jerusalem will be part of the Palestinian capital, the Jewish parts of Jerusalem, including those parts which were built after the 67 war, will be part of the state of Israel, the sovereignty of Israel, and will be the capital of the state of Israel. And the holy sites will be administered by five nations. As I said, America, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Jordan and the Palestinians. This will allow a freedom of religion, uh, 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 open access to everyone, and it will maintain and it will protect the nature of these holy places for all people that cherish them, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. This is my plan. Yes, uh, and, uh, right there in the blue shirt. Sorry. Hi, thank you. I'm Matt Duss. I'm at the Center for American Progress. Um, Say it again. Matt Duss. I'm with the Center for American Progress. It's a think tank here in D.C. Yeah. Um, a, a question first on, on the, um, the talks you had with um, Abu Mazen. There was an interview you gave several weeks ago um, with Avi Sakharov, the, j the journalist, in which you discussed the details of, y of your talks. Yeah. Um, and you know, you said some of what you had said here about, you know, he didn't say no, but he didn't respond. But the way that your remarks were spun, I think, by many here in D.C., especially on the right side, was that this is more evidence that the Palestinians are simply not interested in agreement and there's no partner for peace. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you interpret that. Do you agree with that? And, and very quickly, on the Arab Peace Initiative, do you think that the current unrest in the region, how does that impact the viability of the peace initiative as a basis for, for future negotiations? Well, the first section is that I never said, never did I mean to say that uh, the fact that he s s didn't say no was really uh, just a more polite way of uh, blaming him for not having peace with Israel. I, I, uh, there were many reasons, some of which can be uh, understood. You know, I kept saying all the time when people talk to me about Abu Mazen, they said he's not serious, he's not really... Uh, he doesn't mean it seriously, he's uh, very weak, and so on and so forth. I said, look, everyone within the context of Israel understands that the pressures uh, on Bibi from the right wing makes it very difficult for him to take a decision and must be understood, it must be uh, you know, reconciled with that. Uh, it's not easy because, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, settlers, the supporters, and some of the extreme representative of the Likud within this, uh, their parliamentary faction, and they are now more than they were in the past, make it impossible for Bibi. I don't accept it, by the way. I think that if someone in the position of leadership needs to take a decision against the tide, against the, uh, the uh, general attitude of some of his uh, members, he, this is where his leadership should be tested. 
But I say, you understand it about Bibi and you don't understand it about Abu Mazen? Does he not have Dachlan who is ready to overthrow him any minute? And what about the Hamas? And what about all the others in his own party? Do you think that opposition is a creation only of Israeli politics? So he's got his problems just as well. And I don't agree that he is not a partner. He said against, he said that he is against terror when he was number two to Yasser Arafat. In the middle of the second intifada, he stood up and said, I am against it. At a time when Arafat perpetrated it. So I think that he is a partner for peace. And I don't know amongst the Palestinians who may be a better partner for peace. So if we want peace, we have to find the good excuses why to make peace with him rather than to say why he is not ready to make peace. And also, if you read, uh, you know, I'm not a sale uh, representative for, uh, uh, salesman for uh, Condi Rice's book or, John, uh, or George Bush's uh, book, but if you read her book, she writes some stunning things about how senior Israelis came to, us, to, to her, to her, and to Abu Mazen and advise them, stay away from Olmert. Don't, don't, don't cherish his proposals because soon enough he will be gone. And who knows, maybe you can get more and so on and so forth. At a time when she said to the president that she he is right that when he said to her that Olmert wants peace, except that she thinks that Olmert will not leave. He will die because they killed Rabin for far less. So I don't want to judge. I quote you from the book of Condi Rice. And it's written. It's written. No, it's written. I wasn't present when she met with Israelis, senior Israelis who told her, don't, don't go uh, uh, forward with, uh, with uh, Olmert's proposals. I wasn't there. I, I, can't, I, I can't verify it or, or, or deny it. I can only quote from what she wrote from meetings. And I don't see any reason that she will write it unless she <laughs> She says the truth. She's not an enemy. She's a good friend. She's a good friend of Israel. She's a good friend of me. She's a good friend of others in Israel. And I like her very much. And she was very constructive as a foreign minister. She visited the Middle East 25 times at the time that I was prime minister. This is not uh, insignificant. So I don't want to blame anyone. I don't want to blame ourselves, definitely. I don't want to blame the Palestinians. And I don't want to blame the Americans. I want that all these forces will understand the urgency that we are in and that everything depends entirely on a breakthrough between us and the Palestinians. And that also refers to the Arab countries. I think that we can't afford to have for a long time this coolness in the relations between us and Egypt. Egypt is a partner. Egypt, uh, uh, Egyptians' interests are to have very much better relations with Israel. For the time being, it's very psychologically, I can understand, it's tough for the uh, Egyptians, Muslim brothers, who spoke like Hamas and like others suddenly to, uh, to create the same kind of spirit of relations that we had with Mubarak. But it's something that must be dealt with. An agreement with the Palestinians will have an enormous impact on the ability of Israel to create a dialogue with all Arab countries, and it will also help to quieten down the unrest among some of them, which is now uh, a, a quite a major problem for many of them. I think Turkey should be a major power in helping Israel to create this kind of dialogue, and therefore I was in favor of uh, uh, a rapprochement with uh, Turkey long ago. I said to, uh, I said it publicly in Israel three years ago, we will apologize to Turkey. Don't, don't worry, we will apologize to Turkey. The question is what we will pay until we apologize. If we will apologize now, the price will be little. If we will apologize three years from now, it will be much higher. And unfortunately, again, I was right. So. <laughs> Uh, but still, I think that Turkey should play a major role, not because Turkey is ideal, not because I agree with everything that Erdogan said or that he does, not at all, because there is no alternative. And Turkey, of course, again, with the assistance, with the umbrella support, with the energies, with the enthusiasm, and with the power of the United States of America mobilizing all these forces, it still can be done.
Let's take two or three questions together. I think that's probably about all we're going to have time for. Yes, right over here. Please identify yourself. Yeah, my name is Herbert Grossman. I'm a retired judge. When Barack pulled out of South Lebanon in 2000, and when uh, Sharon pulled out of Gaza in 2004, the military, Israeli military, thought that they had complete control and they were uh, prepared for everything, especially since they had unfettered control of the sky. You, more than anyone, should realize that that didn't come about, that in 2007, Israel suffered a great defeat in the Lebanese war because they have no response to people dug in with loads of rockets that they can fire within seconds. Yet a year later, you propose that Israel pull out of the high ground uh, in the West Bank, in which you know that sooner or later Palestinians will dig in and will have tens of thousands of rockets uh, that they are able to fire at uh, Netanyahu and Tel Aviv. <coughs> what do you say to the people who say that the reason you're promoting all that is really because of your personal legal problems, you're trying to ingratiate yourself all right, so we have, we, thank you, thank you. Well, we know, we have, we just, it's not that. It's just, we're running out of time. No, what do you expect from a judge? I want a question. I want a, What do you expect from a judge? But seriously, right. this is, this is question, question and answers. Your military strategy, your military strategy that you didn't have in, in South Lebanon, what is your military strategy against that type of warfare and from the high ground of Judge the West Grossman, Bank. Judge Grossman. Yes. I understood you. <laughs> Believe me, I understood you. I will answer you. Okay. But but uh, yeah, that's one Aaron, question. Let's do yes, let's do Aaron another two. Proposal. Yes, right in the center here. Thank you. I'm Professor Wayne Glass from the University of Southern California with my excellent students here studying nuclear issues. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you said that uh, at the beginning of their remarks that uh, Iran was the largest remaining threat with respect to Israel. Uh, let's dream a little bit and let's assume that we do reach a resolution with the Palestinians. How will that play out, in your opinion, uh, regarding the Iranian threat? Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Yes, right here. Um, yes, that's right. Sorry. Thank you, Paulette Lee, communications consultant. Mr. Prime Minister, you have said, I've heard other people also say that this is not only the best time, but maybe the last time that a peace agreement can be reached. What do you mean by that? Why? It's been going for 65 years. Why not another year? <laughs> okay, so we have Israeli withdrawals, Gaza, Lebanon, we have nuclear, and we have best time, last yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, Judge Grossman. I'm sure that you're a great, a great expert on legal matters. I doubt your understanding about strategic geopolitics. Uh, uh, the war in Lebanon was the greatest achievement, military achievement that in the history of the state of Israel and the history of the wars between Israel and the Arab countries. The first time that a result of a war for seven years now we have a quiet front. There was not one bullet shot from the north to the state of Israel since the last day of August, almost seven years ago, uh, of 14th of August, when the ceasefire was declared. Is this a, a failure? This is a great achievement. There wasn't a, ever in any of the Israeli military confrontations, the greatest war in the history of the state of Israel was the Six Day War, right? Three months later, we started the war of attrition in the border of Sinai and in the, uh, uh, at the beginning in, uh, in, uh, in the north, and uh, we made an agreement in the north, and uh, after three years and after hundreds of Israeli soldiers killed, we made another agreement of ceasefire in 1970 with uh, Egypt. Uh, only to uh, face the uh, Yom Kippur War in 1973. There was not one war which ended up with complete silence for seven years without one bullet shot and with complete change in the quality of life of the entire north part of the state of Israel. So there was a misperception. 
It was a misperception. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not criticizing you. You're not supposed to understand me. You understand in other matters, and probably very, very uh, good. But in these matters, uh, others didn't understand at the beginning. Now, they have changed their opinion. Why? Because the reality is stronger than the rhetoric. What can we do? And when you see that for seven years, the they, uh, Hezbollah refrained from doing anything. Now, not that things didn't happen in the last seven years between us and Syria and between us and the Hezbollah. Many things happened. I can't speak about some of these things, but it was published here in America, not in Israel, of what we did in Syria. Now, in order to save Assad, they sent thousands of troops of Hezbollah to Syria to fight against the rebels. But when it was attributed to Israel that something terrible happened in Deir Azur, 450 kilometers from Israel, that Israel destroyed something which was strategically essential for the Syrian plans, no one responded, no one said a word. Why? Because we have created a deterrence in the war in Lebanon. So I entirely disagree with your perception. I entirely disagree with un your understanding. That's number one. Number two, the other lesson which we learned in the war in Lebanon in the Castlewood operation. Now, I understand that the Castlewood operation infuriates, uh, uh, infuriated some of the people that came here to uh, heckle me and to uh, take me to uh, the uh, International uh, uh, Court of Justice in order to arrest me for the rest of my life for war crimes. But I want to remind you that the cast lead operation started only after thousands of rockets were shot at innocent Israelis in their homes in Ashkelon, in, in, in uh, Beersheba, and in Ashdod, and in other places. A million Israelis were sitting for weeks in shelters. Now, I don't know, and I say it to world leaders who ever talked with me, that any country in the world, whether America or Great Britain or France or Germany or Italy or anyone else or Spain, would have sat quiet without responding when one of the cities would have been attacked by 20 missiles by another country or from another uh, border and they would have immediately responded in order to save the, uh, their, uh, the life of the citizens. This is a primary responsibility of every country, is to provide security for their people. But, and this is very important, and I urge all of you to remember it, particularly those who are experts in, in the international uh, uh, law. During the 33 days that we were attacking we were responding to the attacks from Lebanon, there was not one time that there was any uh, uh, movement in the United Nations against the State of Israel, including by Arab countries. Not strange? No. You know why? Because Israel pulled out entirely from Lebanon and we responded from within territories which the international community recognized to be part of the state of Israel. And therefore we exercise the fundamental right of self-defense for the Israeli people. That's why we could do it in spite of the fact that from a technical military point of view, maybe, maybe, I'm not that certain that pulling out from Lebanon gave a certain advantage to the uh, Lebanese. But the fact that we were out of Lebanon justified the Israeli reaction in the eyes of the international community, which is not insignificant. The same is for Castle operation. There was not one motion in the United Nations against Israel by any country. And at the end of Castle operation, may I remind you, all of the top leaders of Europe, with a notice of less than 24 hours, came to the residence of the Prime Minister of Israel, Gordon Brown, Sarkozy, Angela Merkel, Silvio Berlusconi, Topolanek, the, uh, the uh, leader of the EU, and uh, uh, Zapatero, Prime Minister of Spain, not the friendliest to Israel previously, 
and all of them with about 12 foreign ministers of other countries stood up in front of the televisions and said Israel had a right to defend itself. You know why? Because we did it from within boundaries which were recognized by the international community to be ours. Now, it's true. Do you think that the Palestinians can't shoot rockets if they want today on Natanya and Fasaba and Tel Aviv? The distance between the territories which are now controlled by them and these places, given the range of the rockets that they have, they can shoot anytime they want. So if the range of rockets that the Palestinians may possess is the criterion by which we will judge which borders we need to have, then we will have to go up to Iraq maybe. Is this the solution? I'll tell you what. A terror is a serious danger and I may assume that even after the end of all the conflict and the signing of peace treaty there will still be terror here and there. Israel is strong enough to deal with it. It's much better to deal with it than to be isolated entirely in the international community for being perceived as occupiers of territories and of uh, a country which denies the fundamental human and political rights of few million Palestinian people. I don't want to live in such a country. Now, this is one thing. You can choose one, either the nuclear issue or the best. Well, I'll, I'll make it short. I'll make it short. Uh, I think, I don't think that the Palestinian problem, uh, the resolution professor, uh, I actually met yesterday afternoon uh, someone who studies political science in the uh, University of South California. He was in New York in one of my lectures, so maybe he's your pupil, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't think that it will resolve the issue, that the uh, resolution of the conflict between us and Palestinians will remove the uh, Iranian threat from the agenda. It can create a much better atmosphere amongst many of the other Arab countries. It may help create a much stronger united front of moderate Arab countries which sympathize entirely with the Israeli attitude, which are as opposed to the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, plan just as we are, but which are weak and which are a little bit scared of the divisions amongst themselves and of the emergence of radical forces there uh, and therefore they hide their real attitude. If there will be a breakthrough between Israel and the Palestinians it may cre help create a much stronger united front of the moderate Arab countries together with Israel, together with America and Great Britain, France and Germany and others in order to uh, deal with Iran in a very effective manner and I think that for this we still have the time. Now what we may not have time for is to divide, to separate from the Palestinians before it's too late. Because how long do you think Israel can keep 4 million or 5 million or 6 million on a one day 9 million Palestinians without voting rights? 46 years already they live under the, uh, the leadership under the control of the state of Israel without having the fundamental human rights and political rights that everyone wants to exercise. Now, what does it mean to have a Palestinian state if the Palestinian residents and citizens are not allowed to decide for themselves what they are doing? And this can be only if there will be separation. But there may come a time, and it's not too long, that the Palestinians will say, you know what? We don't want to divide the land. We only want one person, one vote. When this will come, we'll be in great trouble. And you know what? At least I can say that in December of 2003, prior to the decision of Arik Sharon for this engagement, I made this statement on the grave of David Ben-Gurion and it started the process that ended up with the disengagement. Now I think that we have to repeat it in order to bring this process into a conclusion by a peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians. Hey, 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 I must say, I, I'm sorry for the disruptions, but I, I have to say they were, they were trumped, frankly, in an amazing way, in an amazing way, number one, by your patience, but even more impressive than that, in my view. Um, and I've worked with many Israeli prime ministers, all kinds of parties, by one other thing, by your clarity, 
and, and your honesty. It is so hard for leaders to look in a mirror and understand that when you want to make a change, frankly, the place to start is with yourself. And the fact is, it's really quite stunning. And I, you, you honor and grace the Wilson Center with your presence. Please join me in, um, in thanking you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. One, one additional point. Can you, can you remain seated until the Prime Minister departs, which will only take 30 seconds. Jane? Thank you very much. I was really honored to have had this opportunity to be a guest at the Woodrow Wilson Institute. And thank you, Jane, very much, and you, Aaron, for inviting me. And thank you for your patience. And I only regret that those who oppose me didn't have the courage to remain in this place and listen to me. OK, you want to heckle me, heckle me. You want to yell at me, yell at me. You want to think that I am a criminal? This is legitimate. But stay in and listen to me. Maybe I will even convince you. Thank you. Can we do it out there?